So basically, I've been making some concrete holds um, for climbing walls, uh, like this guy. And um, I thought it would be worth going over some of the things I found while making them um, and try and really like dig into uh, some of the considerations, some of the things you need to think about, uh, and some of the kind of tips and tricks that I've uh, come across while doing it. Um, before I start, obviously, massive disclaimer, um, these are pretty finicky. Um, I think the bigger blob shapes are pretty strong, but it's very easy to make a shape that isn't strong enough for a climbing hold. Uh, and I think you need to be quite careful um, with them while you're making them. You need to make sure that uh, you have good matting. Uh, you need to make sure that the attachment holes are good, as I'll talk about later. Um, and obviously I don't accept any responsibility for anything that happens uh, while using them. Um, but I think that the technique's actually really good. Um, I think it does make good climbing holds, and I think particularly um, if you're quite cash constrained, uh, concrete climbing holds can be fantastic. And particularly, we found that it's actually really hard to get some particular types of holds at a reasonable price easily. Um, you know, in the UK, uh, we have a pretty good climbing hold, you know, selling landscape because we have access to most of the European market as well. Um, but it's still actually really hard to find, you know, cost effective. Um, you know, interesting climbing holds. And when you can't get your hands on them, it can be really hard to pick up a hold that's, uh, you know, good for your your slope of wall and your climbing styles that you like to set. Um, and I think there's also something very satisfying about making your own holds. Um, you know, it's not quite as fancy as a, as a bought hold, but I think there's something really nice and cool about some of the shapes that you can make. Um, and I think it's a good start for, you know, you've just built your climbing wall, you want to get into, uh, get some holds. You don't want to drop, you know, 500 pounds on holds, which would be kind of what you'd be looking at to get a really good set of holds. So you can just bash them out. Um, you know, maybe they get replaced, maybe they're your favorite holds. Um, who knows, but I've, I've done a good uh, load of them. And so I think I've got a relatively good grasp on uh, what the factors are. Um, so let's get started. Okay, so first up, uh, talking about materials. Um, you know, I'm calling them concrete ho climbing holds, but to be honest, I'm actually using cement. I'm using uh, Mastercrete, um, all-purpose or possibly the premium cement. And that's just the cement that I've been able to buy from the local hardware store. It's about, I think, five pounds for 25 kilos. So it's a really, really inexpensive material. Uh, you could probably use concrete, but concrete has the, the aggregate ad additives, so that would be sand um, or gravel, and that's going to make finishing much harder, it's going to make the surface much rougher, um, and to be honest, I probably wouldn't recommend it, you know, concrete's so cheap, cement, sorry, it's so cheap that there's pretty much no point using concrete. Um, if it's what you had lying around, you know, maybe give it a shot, but you know, when we're talking about five pounds for a bag of material, um, it's really not a major consideration. One thing I will say though is that I don't think cement on its own is necessarily the best material and particularly if you're getting into the more sort of um, thinner shapes um, where you're putting a lot of tensile load on the concrete. No, concrete's really not that strong uh, in tensile load. Um, and so one thing that I have been experimenting with is adding glass fibre reinforcement. Um, and I see a lot of concrete additives which are um, plastic fibre reinforcement. I think that would also be fantastic. Um, you know, it's just to add that tensile strength and you mix it into the dry mix before you add the water. Um, it makes the concrete slightly harder to work while it's wet, but I think, you know, the strength benefits you get will be, you know, completely worth it. Um, particularly for shapes where you have a lot of tensile strength uh, needed in them. Uh, and so that would be things like jugs or um, sort of horns sticking out or thin edges of any kind, basically, that tensile strength is going to be really important. They're pretty cheap to add, you know, although you could easily be talking about the same cost as <laughs> cement, the whole thing is quite a cheap enterprise. I think, to be honest, random oriented glass fibre for fibre glassing is quite a good shout, but it's horrible stuff to work with. You really need to use gloves uh, and sanding it. You'll need to make sure that you are in a well ventilated space. Um, ideally sanding wet, you know, really be careful about your hands with it because it's really not nice stuff, but it sands better. I think the plastic stuff is likely to sand 
not particularly well. And then the last thing is, you know, you get a lot of grey holds out of this. Um, and, you know, they're not that thrilling a colour. I think they can give quite a nice aesthetic. Um, but what we've also been playing with is black stains. Um, so this is just carbon black added to the concrete. You have to add a hell of a lot of carbon black to um, to get it. You know, I think I was doing maybe a um, five to 10 kilo pour, but it had like 100 grams of carbon black in it. And that can actually add quite a lot to the cost of the holds. Um, they look really cool. Um, you know, you get this nice black color, but as soon as you get chalk on them, you know, they go gray anyway. Swings and roundabouts. I think probably the best way would be to to take the roots or maybe to paint them with acrylics afterwards in the areas where you're not going to be touching so much. On this hold, for instance, you know, there's a lot of areas that you're just not going to be using while you're climbing it like this, where you could get some color on there if you want to kind of identify sets of holds for roots. So then the next question is, how do you actually form the climbing holds? Get the shape that you want. And I think that is pretty tricky, to be honest. Um, I started by using sort of open sand casting. So I had a bed of sand and I impressed and scooped out a shape of a climbing hold. Uh, and that works really well for these kind of smooth shapes. And you get a bit of overhang in there to get something a bit more positive. You know, I was targeting a 20 degree overhang. So something like this is actually really positive, um, but it's still, you know, it's still non-trivial to climb. And I think that's what this technique's really good at. Um, so that was really kind of making this shape in the sand um, and that can lead to all sorts of shapes. Um, but it's also slightly unpredictable. So this is another one. You can see it's quite sort of uneven. Um, it's much less positive. Um, and I was sort of targeting a fairly similar shape than the others, but less positive. Um, and so I think this is a technique that takes a bit of kind of getting used to basically. What I did try is uh, cutting a concrete sort of shape about the right uh, diameter for my hand because what I was finding is a lot of my holds that I bought commercially um, very cheaply uh, were really stressing my second finger joint too much and I really wanted something with a more open hand position and so I was trying to get a sense of what size that had to be and so once you cut it out of cardboard you can kind of sweep it in the form a little bit and just see roughly what the right uh, right sort of curvature is to get those nice shapes um, and I think this guy who I've already shown is really the, the best of what I've done with that. You know, really got um, a very flat top and that makes a sloper that, um, you know, is pretty challenging on the 20 degree, but is absolutely fine. Like it, you can climb it, um, but it's just hard enough that you have to pay attention. You have to engage your hand. And so that's a really good hold. Now, the great thing about sand casting is it's very, very cheap. You know, a bag of sand is, um, you know, three pounds maybe. Um, I just put it in a washing up bowl or a, a, like a spare plastic box I had lying around. You damp the sand down and that's really important because it makes it kind of stick together. Um, you know, it holds all of the other fixings and stuff that you need in it perfectly, kind of very intuitive to mold. Um, and it also interacts well with the concrete. You know, there's no um, worry that you're introducing something that's gonna harm the concrete. Um, one thing I did found is I bought sort of builder's sand that is a, a very wide variety of grain sizes um, and that makes quite a rough casting. It's very hard to make a really smooth surface with it um, and I think there's a great scope there to make a kind of green sand with a, an addition of a few percent um, clay and there's a great video uh, that people have done on, uh, on making green sand out of sand that's pretty easy and I think it just adds a bit more structural integrity to that wet sand which means that it's easier to smooth out. You probably get better overhangs on it. Um, and it's what people use for real casting. And so it seems obvious to do. The other way that I've done is with foam board molds. Um, and that's really interesting actually. Um, so making a sort of three dimensional shape out of foam board um, that will contain your final hold. Uh, and so you can get shapes like this. And this is really cool, I think. You know, you get this sort of very geometric, um, shape out of things um, and I think they can look really cool and they're the sort of holds that you really can't get um, more or less any other way I think you know obviously if you were going and casting polyurethane you could um, you know if you were 3d printing a mold or something you could but I think you know this is a really powerful technique foam board again is super cheap it's really really cheap it's very quick 
to make shapes out of. You know, I basically just cut the shape, I duct tape it together. Um, and I think, you know, it takes a little bit of time to get used to the kind of paper craft elements of it to get those shapes in your head. Um, but to be honest, you can either just experiment, you know, it's, it's such an easy medium to experiment in, or you can model it up in something like um, SketchUp or Blender and then like unfold it and see what shapes you need to do and then sort of start to get a feeling for how you do those. Um, one thing that's really important though about this, and I've done a few holds with this, is that you support the mould when you pour the concrete because concrete's actually really heavy um, and foam board really isn't that strong um, and doesn't withstand water very well. It starts to disintegrate when it gets contacted with the wet cement. Uh, and so what you want to do is build up a sand um, support around it that just keeps those walls flat because otherwise what, you, what happens is that the mould opens out um, and all of your f beautiful flat edges become um, bowed and uh, it'll happen while the concrete's going off and it'll all be a huge mess. So that's one thing that's really important with the foam board. Um, the other thing I think to consider is that those hard edges are quite uncomfortable. Um, you know, this is a really cool looking hold, but actually in terms of how it feels in the hand, it's pretty grim. Um, you know, particularly the tip is really sharp um, it really hits the wrong part of your hand. And so to be honest, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this one for handholds. I think it might be a really interesting thing for like hard technical feet. Um, I think you could do some like cool techie slopers with it as well. If you went for angles less extreme, uh, you know, I was trying to make a jug here. I've made a jug, um, but it's quite painful. Um, but I think if you were going for like weird sloper or if you just spent a bit more time rounding off this edge um, later, I think this would be really good. I think there's a scope for 3D printing moulds where you just make a very, very thin mould out of the 3D printed uh, material, it maybe in vase mode or something, and then also put it in sand just like the others, um, and then break away the 3D print from the outside. I've not tried it. Um, it, but it seems kind of interesting, and I think particularly if you wanted a particular feature that was hard to model, so maybe like a pocket would be really hard to model, um, or to replicate uh, lots of the same hold, or replicate something you've seen in sort of out in on the real rock, you could sort of photogrammetry something and then print it. I think it would be really cool. I've not seen anyone uh, do that specifically, those sort of lost print castings, but I think it could be really interesting. So I think one of the biggest things about climbing holds is the hole placement. You know, that's how you attach them to the wall. And I think with concrete holds particularly, you know, the material is not a material that's strong in tension. Um, it's really strong in compression. Uh, and with the fiber additives, it is a lot stronger in tension and is perfectly like good, I think, as a hold material if you're careful. There's some major caveats to that that I'll get onto later, but um, I think you know, hold placement goes a long way into, you know, making the hold secure and safe and easy to set with as well. So generally I'm trying to put one big bolt hole in the center of where the force will go through. So that's very key. You know, when you're holding a hold, you're going to put force sort of down through the center of its mass generally. But if you're making a hold with sort of some weird shapes to it, it might well be that that's not the case. Um, and it might be that the main forces will be going through the side or, you know, in a place that's not obvious. And so generally I'm putting, you know, a hole right in the center of the hold um, to take most of the load. So this will be like an M10 bolt um, going into a T-nut. This is good because there's lots of sort of meat in the concrete to hold the bolt. It can really help compress the, the hold onto the wall and give you that attachment strength. But every single hold that I'll make will have a bolt hole. Um, I think this is really important uh, to stop the hold spinning obviously, but I think particularly with concrete holds you don't want to torque them down in the same way that you torque a plastic hold down. Because plastic holds, you know, as you torque them down they sort of conform to the wall, they'll spread a bit, they'll spread that load. Um, and so quite often, at least in my experience, you know, if you're not climbing hard on them, you don't need a, a screw on. But on the concrete holds, you don't have quite that luxury in terms of being able to really tighten them down. Because if you tighten them way down, 
and, and start to compress them, they might well crack. Um, and so much better to tighten them down so they're snug. You know, obviously you want them tight, um, but then, you know, get that, that real attachment to the wall through one or two wood screws. Um, and so, you know, most of the holds I've done will have two wood screws and I'll use both of them. Um, this one, I've only got one wood screw. I think, you know, it's a little cheeky, but there's a lot of meat in the, uh, in the bolt hole um, that really does take a lot of, of load. So I think you really need to be careful about your, your hole placement and particularly with the bigger, bigger holds, you know, the wood screws start to become major structural um, parts of it. The second question is, how do you actually put the, the holes in the castings? Because you really don't want to be doing this after the fact. You know, drilling green concrete is a messy business. It's pretty horrible. And you're also hugely at risk of cracking the holes. Um, and I think that's a thing you've got to remember is that the concrete is very, very weak when it comes out of, you know, in the green stage, when you're taking it out of the mold. Um, it really is weak and it's very easy to crack. Um, particularly if you're drilling it. And I've, I've cracked a hold while removing the dowels and stuff. So adding holes. So I've, there's two methods that I've kind of looked at. Um, one of which is using dowels um, covered in something slightly soft. So um, either electrical tape or a foam layer and then electrical tape. Uh, and then I've sort of drilled the dowels so they kind of fit into each other. So you've got the big dowel for the out of wall side where the head of the screw or the head of the bolt goes and then the much thinner side where the uh, where the shank of the bolt goes through. So I used those, they were pretty good, a little tricky to remove I think. Um, if you used some of that uh, kind of craft foam just so you've got a little bit of wiggle room to pull them out and you just want to like tap them very gently out. The other way and obviously this requires a printer uh, is I, I've 3D printed these tubes basically, and I think you could just buy tubes. Um, and then little adapter pieces that go from the thin tube to the thick tube. And this is actually really cool because the adapter piece is also, um, you know, it's plastic and gives you that um, stress spreading ability. Um, one thing that I worry about is when you crank down a metal bolt onto concrete, somewhere in the concrete is going to be the high spot. You make the stress concentration area that's really going to propagate a crack if there is one and really going to stress the hold out. If you put a little bit of plastic in between that, it's not perfect, but it will just spread those loads just a little bit. Um, and I think make the holds less likely to crack while you're, you know, tightening them down. One thing that I have found with the 3D printed stuff is that it's not working very well for the wood screws. Um, I think this is because I was targeting four mil wood screws or maybe three and a half with the head size and the shank size was four mil. And so they're too close, basically. Uh, there's not enough meat to support the head. Um, and where I haven't got enough depth in the concrete with that shank diameter, um, they're just pulling through. Uh, and this is a real issue, um, a really, really big issue, actually. Um, so I think if I was going to do this again, I would probably try casting in metal or plastic washers uh, into those wood screw places to just give more meat into the concrete where the joining region is. Um, and I think several of my holds, um, the wood screws have gone straight through when you've tightened them down. Um, I think particularly if you don't have a clutch drill, it's very hard to tell when you're over tightening them, when you're um, breaking through. and. You know, that's a flaw in the hold design, absolutely. Um, so something to avoid. Um, so I think washers in the wood screws, I think even if you're doing it with, with the dowels, would be great. Um, I think a thick plastic washer would probably be the best thing to do, something really tough, um, because you want a little bit of, of movement in it. You want it to conform to the screw a little bit because you don't want those high stress points, the concrete. Alternatively, I think just having a, a bigger difference in diameter, and I think places where I'm using a four or four and a half mil screw, um, there's basically no issues. And the holes, you just push them into the sand, uh, make sure that they're really clean around it. I tried putting uh, a little bit of plasticine uh, with the uh, with the foam board molds, a little bit of plasticine around uh, the hole tubes. It worked okay, but it's a real mess in the finishing uh, to have that plasticine there. I think clay would be better. It also floats um, up into the concrete. So instead of kind of staying sealed down, it just floats up and then you have a bit of plasticine in the roof of your concrete. It's really not ideal. So finishing. Uh, the cement takes about uh, 
8 to 18 hours ish to get to that uh, green state and then it stays in the green state for another 10 15 hours i'd guess um, but definitely there's this consistent hardening throughout the period and so different stages of finishing want a different greenness um, and so i think this is something you just need to play around with the couple of holds and you'll get a sense for it but usually i did the castings um, at kind of 8 p.m on one night and then at lunchtime the next day I did the first round of finishing, just took them out of the mould. Um, and then I probably finish up the finishing in the evening. Um, worked quite well while I was working from home. Um, but what do I mean by finishing um, is the question. So when you get something out of the sand, uh, you get something with sand all over it. Um, you get something quite rough, unless you've been really careful with your mould. Uh, and you get something without a really flat bottom. Uh, and I think, you know, these are three things you want to get rid of basically. The sand looks quite ugly and so it starts by just kind of brushing and scraping it off. You know I have a couple of trowels that I use for that and um, so I sort of scrape it off. I brush the surface with uh, uh, either a soft brush or a wire brush and I get most of the sand off and that also helps start to round the shape over and particularly with the scraper and with the brush you can start to get um, a little bit of refinement on the shape and you'll never get the shape that you really want out of the sand casting mold. You know, there's always some fine like curves to it that you haven't quite nailed and maybe the area around the hole's a bit disrupted from where you put it in. And so you've got this opportunity to really smooth out the hold and, and make the shape really quite aesthetic. And green concrete is really soft. It's really surprisingly soft and you can do a lot with it. Now, one thing on the flip side though, is really horrible on your hands. You need to make sure you wear uh, gloves ideally um, because it will dry your hands out like nobody's business uh, and it's really grim um, and so you can go from you know something like this this is pretty unfinished this hole this is the first one I made um, it has this great grippy texture probably be terrible on your skin to be honest but you get fantastic grip out of it you know it's really um, really feels nice in terms of that but it's quite uneven you know I think better better open cast uh, molding could be better and the back of it's fairly uneven. I think this is the next level of finishing so I've taken a lot more of the sand off. I've smoothed the shape a, lo a lot over and I've quite aggressively brushed it and so for this one the texture is really coming from the, the brushing and it's got a lovely brushed texture um, much nicer on your skin uh, feels much better and I've had a chance to kind of finesse the shape a little bit and then I think going one step further is something like this where uh, it's mostly smoothed out um, it's given me a chance to really round over the shape really um, get something that I like the feel of um, and so you can do a lot in finishing um, you know you kind of could almost imagine making just a load of block shapes and then finishing them to what you wanted. And I think with this guy, you know, is a great example. I didn't cast in the weird mouth thing, um, but it's a fantastic way of adding this like micro pinch. It gives a huge variety to the hold. And I carved it in while it was green. Um, you know, you can do so much while it's green. And I really like finessed this so that it was, it felt really good. So I'd really recommend, you know, planning to spend a bit of time in the green phase. I think as you get better at the casting, and um, particularly with if you used green sand, you know, the, the finishing steps reduce quite significantly. Now the other major finishing step, other than sort of the aesthetics of the front, is making the back flat. Um, and I think this is best done um, by using a sheet of ply with some sand on it as your sandpaper, because most sandpaper just gets destroyed in the process. You know, you're doing it very wet, that's very key, you want to keep it very wet because it just makes a sludge straight away. Uh, and quite often you have quite a lot of material to remove. You know, when you're doing the casting, it's never perfectly flat. Um, particularly because you've got these holes, you know, the, the plugs for the holes there. And so you can't run something over the top and really smooth it out. You can do your best, but it's never that good. Uh, and the concrete actually contracts, I think, in a little, little bit in the middle, hollow in the back. And you kind of want a hollow in the back because you want the holes to be bearing around the outside. So board, sand, rub it, keep looking at it to see where it's sanding away and maybe pushing, you know, where you want more material removed. Um, if it's quite green, then you can get quite a lot of material removal just with a, a trowel, just to kind of get that initial flattening off so that you're not sanding for ages. 
but it goes pretty fast with like a coarse sand or the sand you're casting with just on a board uh, works really well. Um, and you, you do want the back pretty flat. Although one thing that I will say is you've got to make sure just to chamfer very gently uh, the edges because what you don't want is all of that uh, fixing force to be going right through the edges of the concrete because then you're going to put this huge amount of force where it's thinnest uh, and the edges might well chip out. So, you know, flatten it out and then just angle it slightly and just take the edges off. And I might do that with a, a piece of sandpaper, a piece of coarse sandpaper. Uh, and you can also sand the front uh, if you want. And I think particularly with these geometric shapes, uh, I used the board sanding method to get these surfaces really flat and then finished them with proper sandpaper to make them really smooth. They're never perfect when you get them out of the moulds, but they're pretty good, um, but you can just whip them up. But these, I've also chamfered all the corners, so it makes a less sharp, more robust hold. Um, I think if I was going to do these again, I would probably take a big chamfer. I might even put uh, clay in the mould in those chamfers, just because they're pretty uncomfortable with the hands. But I find the finishing process really nice. And I think a wire brush is the absolute best tool uh, to get texture. Um, it really helps adding, you know, you don't want a perfectly smooth hold unless you're going for something really um, like weird and technical. You want some texture to grip onto. You don't want too much texture, but the wire brush lets you put texture in the direction that you want. You know, it lets you apply the amount of texture you want. Um, and I would do this when it's a little bit less green so maybe 24 to 36 hours in, it will still be quite soft. Um, it just allows a bit more control. I found when it's greener, it cuts a little deep and then you get quite deep texture straight away and it's very hard to undo. Um, but you have this great fun making this flowing texture around it and I think it gives this very cool effect. Um, and it just makes the hold that much more usable. I think if you don't have texture, the holds, you know, you're likely to dry fire off them. You don't want too much texture because then it'll damage your skin. So I think, you know, this is a good technique. It's worth exploring. Um, and I think there's some shapes that it works better for than others. And I think particularly when you consider what's available commercially, um, it's pretty easy to find, you know, nice jugs and good edges. Um, I think jugs can sometimes be a bit expensive to get a big set of. I think if you really wanted to make a load of things like this, they're really nice holds to 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 use, and I don't think you could really find them uh, that easily for you know probably in total there's a couple of pounds of material in this and a an hour of work. So you know if you've got nothing else on, they're a really cost effective way of getting holds, and particularly you know if you're in a place where holds are less accessible, I think you know. Um, we've really struggled to find holds that you can just buy uh, off the shelf and good holds. Um, you know, so many hold manufacturers just don't sell to sort of retail, basically. Uh, and so you end up just having a handful of, of suppliers and, you know, some of those are very expensive. So I think jugs, I'm not going to do any more jugs, but I could, uh, I can see the value in them. Um, you can't do really overhanging jugs just because the shape limitations of the process but also you know how uh, how strong the concrete is so jugs big open hand jugs you know I'd give it a I'd give it a go um, I think they're a good easy shape to kind of get right to start with um, slopers I think is where it really shines because the textures you get with them are just the right sort of textures for slopers you know where you get that contact strength it's quite a lot like rock because they're quite uneven you know it's not this even texture of of synthetic holds um you get kind of nice uneven shapes that really allow quite a lot of setting detail you know of those micro beaters uh that i think are great fun setting on a home wall uh you know you have that chance to kind of get a feel for it and just see like oh, okay you know move the body position or move the hold um is really quite fun um, so I think slopers are where it really shines and we found a really it's really hard to get a sloper that works well on your angle of wall um, you know we have bought a couple of slopers now almost all of our slopers uh, just don't work on a 20 uh, or at least for our strength you know we're not that strong um, and so that's been a real frustration as we now have quite a lot of slopers that 
either are very cruxy, you know, take a lot of practice, a lot of focus in a route, or um, just aren't usable at all. You know, they're really grim, or you're very forced to a couple of different uses. You know, you have to be very low on them, you have to have good feet. You know, it's not very interesting from a setting point of view. And so being able to make slopers that feel great for your angle of wall are, you know, is a fantastic opportunity. And you get a hold like this, um, you know, and you could easily be paying £50 for a hold like this, um, I found. Um, you know, some suppliers are quite a lot cheaper and you, know, you could easily get a hold like this for £15. But being able to say, OK, that's the angle I want. I want it flat on top. Um, you know, I want a good side. I want a less good side. And to understand that and to have that feedback loop where, you know, you make a hold one day, you get your hands on it. Oh, OK, perhaps it was a bit too slopey. Uh, maybe, you, you know, a little bit later you try setting it um, and you get to feel for it. And, you know, you can't really get that from pictures on a website. You can't get that sort of, oh, how would this actually feel on a 20? How would it feel on an Arat? You know, can I heel hook it? All those sorts of things. Um, and I think, you know, obviously professional setters get a lot of um, hands-on time with holds um, and that gives them a better insight. I find that just getting my hands on the holds is, is better. Um, so I think that's where it really, really shines actually is the slopers. Um, I think these more technical stuff I've made, they're cool, they look really cool. And I've got this particularly massive guy um, that they're, you know, they're really strong wall features. Um, and I think these are really interesting from a sort of, you know, technical success point of view. They're kind of really quite nicely executed, so I'm quite pleased with them. But from a setting point of view, they're so uncomfortable to use that I would think quite carefully about the shapes used. I've made both of these super positive, and that means that the angles on them are really bad. I think if you made some that were more like what you would expect from a wooden volume, a wooden volume that you'd just use as a hold, basically, I think that's where they could be fantastic, where you've got like a 90 degree or maybe just slightly less. Um, and I did actually make one. And I think this is where we get onto the final thing. Um, I made a really cool shape. I made something that I would make in a wooden volume, and now I've got wooden volume making skills. Um, it's this sort of ledge thing, um, you know, it's pretty juggy, a little bit slopey, you know, as a side pull it'd be terrible, um, sort of planning to make some big moves from it and really be a wall feature. And this was done with the same technique with the um, foam board, but before I realised you had to support it with sand, so it was a bit of a failure all round. Um, but I think particularly what happened to it was a failure. Um, and I think that's probably the best shape um, for these techie things, where you've got a 90 degree, I've rounded it right over so that it's actually really comfortable. This is a really comfortable hold, or was a really comfortable hold. Um, and so that's what I recommend to use this technique uh, with, um, is sort of 90 degree angles or just a little bit less, but nothing too uh, acute. I think for feet, it could be really cool. Um, we've set this as like a really techie foot um, on its side, so you have to like toe in around the corner, and this was pretty bad. And I think that has a lot of uh, opportunities. Um, we found again quite hard to get techy, um, techy hard feet. You can't tell from the pictures. You know, is this going to be positive? Is it going to be, you know, highly textured? Is it going to be steep? Is there going to be a good edge on top? Um, you know, we've got a lot of different screw-ons and. I find it pretty hard to set really, really techy feet. And I think particularly this gives you an opportunity to make something quite big, but quite droppable because of the texture. And so that's really interesting. Um, I think these have a lot of potential as feet. And I think this, had it not broke, would have had a lot of potential as a volume, but then you could also make volumes out of wood. Um, about what went wrong with that one, I think this is where sort of, you know, the conclusion has to come. <laughs> Most of these holds have held up um, pretty well. I'm pretty happy with them. I think they're probably safe to climb on, um, but obviously I am only climbing to two and a half meters. We have proper matting. Um, I would never expect anybody else to climb on these. 
Um, and I wouldn't advise you do it without kind of thinking quite critically about the strengths and weaknesses of concrete. Um, we had a hold break uh, during climbing. It was pretty nasty experience, to be honest. Um, but I think it was in the worst possible scenario for a concrete hold. And so I think if we avoid those scenarios, I think the holds are safe. Um, so it was this big wide hold um, and it had four screws in a pattern on it. Uh, none of the screws were in. I think one of them was sort of in, but not very deeply in the wood. Um, but the edge that we were using for the root, uh, my friend had two hands on, on one end of the hold and was dynoing from it. And there were no screws in this end. Um, and so it was completely hanging out, you know, just unsupported basically. Um, and the hold was still green. It was, um, I think probably a week old. And so concrete takes a, a month to get to full strength. And so, uh, you know, a week in is not enough. Um, it had the colouring additives, I think probably didn't help. Um, it was glass fibre reinforced, so um, that should have helped, but I'm not sure entirely it did. Um, but I think really it was just completely unsupported and he was putting, you know, 70, 80 kilos of weight through it in a dynamic movement, you know, really pulling on it um, and pulling out from the wall with it as well. Um, and so this is probably the worst possible case for a hold. Um, you know, I wouldn't be that surprised if a uh, plastic hold broke in that situation, but I don't think it would have failed in the same way. Um, and so I think that's the final thought is these aren't really, really strong. You know, we're still talking about materials here that are, uh, you know, within range of breaking. And even this is quite a meaty hold, you can see um, it's perfectly able to break. And why was this? This was because I had driven a screw in this end, um, good wood screw, um, but I'd driven it too far in and there wasn't enough meat behind it and it had just broken through the hold. And so this is why I think you need to be really careful about the wood screws and I think probably put in some uh, washers um, because it's actually very hard to tell that a wood screw has gone wrong. Um, you know, I think with hindsight and knowing that this is a problem, probably perfectly able to <laughs> notice it, but uh, it's something to be really careful of. Um, and you really don't want to hold breaking, it's pretty horrible. Um, so I think, you know, caution, but like cautious optimism when it comes to these holds. Overall, uh, probably going to make some more slopers, probably not going to make any other shapes. I might make some te technical feet. Um, some sort of really weird slopey feet chip things, like miniature volumes, but, you know, about this big. Um, it's a bit of a mess, um, it's a bit of a faff. Uh, if I had a load of, like, money and access to knowledge about holds, I'd just do that. Um, but I don't, I find it very hard to buy holds that I want, um, and so they're pretty cool. I like the slopers, um, I'd give it a go. Uh, so thanks for watching the video, I uh, hope it was helpful, uh, if you've got any questions about things drop them in the comments, y you know obviously this isn't a step by step guide, uh, it's not really intending to be, um, it's about uh, just some of the factors that I've come across, I just want to kind of get it out there because I found a real like lack of information about them, um, you know I've spoken to a couple of other people who've done it, they all think it's basically fine but not great, um, I agree, it's basically fine but not great. Um, but when it comes to like getting slopers that are really good um, and quite positive and quite cheap, uh, it is really good, I think. Um, I think particularly if you're somewhere where there's not a big climbing community, uh, be absolutely fantastic. Um, and there's also a great satisfaction in, you know, building a climbing wall, building, you know, volumes and building holds, like fantastic. Uh, fantastic fun um, and so I, I'd recommend it give it a shot um, yeah